Well, there's so much going on this past week, I just don't know where to begin. But I think the place to begin is with the Osama bin Laden videotape that surfaced yesterday. Apparently was dropped off at an Al Jazeera station in Pakistan and was televised on Al Jazeera early yesterday morning. Al Jazeera has, is the television channel that broadcasts throughout the Middle East, uh, emanating in the country of Qatar, or as it has now been repronounced, Qatar, and the television channel that the United States government keeps trying to shut down, keeps asking the Qatar government to uh, turn off the air, do something about, stop these guys, they keep broadcasting information that we don't want people to see. So a great deal was said in that Bin Laden videotape, and there have been transcripts published, the longest one being by Al Jazeera itself, but CNN and Fox News have also broadcast transcripts. And on my radio links page, there is a link to the transcript from Al Jazeera, which is, as I say, the longest one, has the most details. It's a very interesting commentary by Osama bin Laden. First of all, he does not say that he and his cohorts hate America because of their freedom, their democracy, and their prosperity, which is something that Bush and his cohorts have just uh, over and over and over and over told us that this is why they hate us, that this is a an outfit of haters who would hate anybody who was free and prosperous, and that's why they're bombing us. <clears throat> but that is not what he said. He said that Bush is deluding you when you say that. The reason we hate America right now is because of America's meddling in the Middle East. And he said, if we really hated freedom, why wouldn't we be attacking Sweden, for example? And he goes on from there. And he, the most interesting thing that he says in the entire tape is that if you do not attack us, we will not attack you. In other words, he's saying we do not want a war. We do not want to continue with this. And if you will stop attacking us, we'll stop attacking you. And it was interesting that when I watched Fox News briefly last night, at the beginning of the newscast, when they were giving the headlines, the headline was, Bin Laden vows to attack America again. And actually, what he said was that, I want you to understand why we attacked Manhattan, so that we will not have to do it again, so that we will not have to repeat this. And so the point being that he was, in effect, holding out the proverbial olive branch to the Americans. And it just is amazing that the response to this from the media, from the candidates for president, I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. He's holding out an olive branch, and Bush told reporters as he was boarding Air Force One on his campaign tour, quote, Americans will not be intimidated or influenced by an enemy of our country. I'm sure Senator Kerry agrees with this. We are at war with these terrorists, and I am confident we will prevail. End of quote. Well, how does that address anything that was in Osama bin Laden's tape? John Kerry said, quote, let me make it clear, crystal clear, as Americans, we are absolutely united in our determination to hunt down and destroy Osama bin Laden and the terrorists. And he added, they are barbarians, and I will stop at absolutely nothing to hunt down, capture, or kill the terrorists wherever they are, whatever it takes, period. Well, it's an amazing response. And, of course, the reason for the response is that each one of these men, George Bush and John Kerry, is trying to appear tougher on terrorism than the other. That's all it's about, is who is more macho? Who will attack the terrorists? Who will catch the terrorists? Who will hunt them down and kill them? The idea that there might be a way to stop the terrorism, to dissuade the terrorists from doing anything further, just is not on the board at all. And what that means to me is that John Kerry and George Bush are playing with your life. They're playing politics with your life. They would rather have there be another attack on an American city than to seem to be soft on terrorism, to be appeasers, to be anything but rabid 100%, hunt them down, shoot them, and kill them, macho he-men who are going to go after terrorism. Now, no one that I know of has ever said, if you just be nice to the terrorists, they will be nice to you. I don't really think that's what this is about. In the first place, America has no business being in the Middle East. Israel's problems are not our problems. Any American who wants to donate money to Israel, go over there and fight for Israel, should be free to do so. But no American should be forced to pay for Israel's defense. No American should be forced to be put at risk so that an American president can court the Jewish vote in America by aiding Israel. No American should uh, be forced to be put at risk because George Bush wants to have troops in Iraq or in Iran or any place else in the Middle East 
That is none of America's business. We may sympathize with foreign countries. We may, as individuals, want to help foreign countries. But our government should not force anybody to do that. And what bin Laden is saying is entirely rational, in my view. What he did to respond to what he felt were indignities to the Arab people was wrong, in my view. But that doesn't change the fact that there might be a way, there might be a way to end all of this. I'm not saying that I know that bin Laden is sincere. I'm not saying that I know that he would keep his word. I'm not saying any of these things. But to reject it all out of hand just to play politics a few days before the election is unconscionable in my view. We were talking about the bin Laden tape and the fact that he was saying that if America will not attack him and his, the, actually he said not attack us, I think he meant the countries of the Middle East, then they would not attack us. And he pointed out that they have never attacked any country that has not been involved in attacks on the Middle East. And that's true, the, at least to the best of my knowledge. The business that's gone on in the Philippines has really had nothing to do with al-Qaeda. Neither did the attacks in Russia have anything to do with al-Qaeda. But al-Qaeda apparently took credit for the attack in Spain because the Spanish government, despite the wishes of the Spanish people, involved Spanish troops in the invasion of Iraq. Now, I said before the break that this turning down of any hope for peace was not new for the United States government. Back in World War I, just after the United States declared war on Germany, the Pope uh, brought forth a peace plan whereby all the countries would retreat to their borders that existed in 1914 at the beginning of the war. The Germans and the Austrians immediately accepted the Pope's offer, and the Russians said that they would consider it and thought that it was, on the whole, a good idea. The British and French did not want to accept it because they thought now with the United States in the war they would be able to overwhelm the Germans and impose a draconian peace on the Germans, which is in fact what eventually happened. But it fell to the United States to make the decision. And Woodrow Wilson issued a refusal, which in fact contained a whole bunch of lies in it about how the war started and what was going on and what the war was all about, and placed all the guilt on Germany, even though the war started when Serbs assassinated an Austrian archduke and Austria declared war on Serbia. So anyway, that was the first time, to the best of my knowledge, that an American president has refused to consider the possibility of peace. The second was during World War II, when Franklin Roosevelt suddenly got this great idea that the slogan of the war would be unconditional surrender. And this, of course, prolonged the war by a good deal, because the German generals felt that even if they over overthrew Hitler, even if they were to surrender and all, uh, that since there were no conditions possible, they might be tried as war criminals because it had already been established that there would be war crimes trials after the war, something that had, to, had never happened before, to the best of my knowledge. And so it prolonged the war in Europe, but it especially prolonged the war in Asia because the Japanese government put out peace feelers several times and said that all they wanted was to keep the emperor on the throne because in Japanese culture, the emperor is a religious figure as well as a political figure. But the United States just kept reiterating that unconditional surrender was the requirement. And as a result, thousands and thousands more Americans died uh, who would not have died otherwise, just as tens of thousands of Americans died in World War I after Woodrow Wilson rejected the peace proposals put forward by the Pope. In the Korean War, it was the same thing. There were negotiations going on for two years in the uh, demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. And it turned out after the war was over that it was the United States that was dragging its feet about the negotiations, that peace plans had been put forward already by the North Koreans, which would have restored the original boundaries between the two countries. But there were several things the United States wanted that it didn't get eventually, but in the process, thousands of people died. I don't know why that was done. I do have definite uh, opinions as to why Wilson and Roosevelt did what they did, but I don't know why Truman prolonged those negotiations other than the possibility that Truman was enjoying being a wartime president and having the powers that were uh, arrogated onto him, the ability to control industries in America, the wage and price controls, all the different ways in which the wartime created a wartime economy that was run by the government. Truman actually seized certain industries and did all sorts of things, and maybe he was reluctant to see the war end, but it's telling that within five months after Eisenhower took over the presidency from Truman, the war was over. So it is not unusual that an American government or any other government would reject a peace plan that might save lives in the country involved. And I'm not trying to pick on the 
American politicians. This is, as I said, not unusual. It could happen in any other country as well. But this is where we live, and this is what we should understand, is that people like George Bush and John Kerry will willingly sacrifice the lives of American citizens in order to achieve some political goal. In this case, seeming, tough, seeming to be tough enough to be able to be the next president of the United States by showing that one is tougher than his opponent. And speaking of the election, here it comes. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be awfully, awfully happy when this campaign is over. Thomas Sowell, who is a conservative economist at the Hoover Institution, summed up what I have heard over and over and over again in this campaign. Quote, Seldom have two presidential candidates presented more starkly contrasting visions of what course to take, both internationally and domestically. Unquote. Well, I hope someone will call in and point out what this difference is between Kerry and Bush. They both want to run Russia out over other countries in order to supposedly win the war on terror. They both want to increase the size of the federal government many times over, it would almost seem. Uh, I just can't imagine what these starkly contrasting visions of what course to take could possibly be, unless it is simply that Kerry wants to be your supreme leader and Bush wants to let you continue, let him continue to be your supreme leader. That's about the only difference that I can come up with. Speaking of quotations, I just have to give you a priceless one before we go to the phone. Rebecca Hagland of the Heritage Foundation said, quote, America and her allies removed the brutal, crazed dictator known as Saddam Hussein. Now here's the really good part. He was taken out before he could carry his rampage against humanity through a continent and beyond. End of quote. In other words, we stopped him at Munich. We stopped him before he could conquer the world. It is amazing how this Hitler phobia uh, just strikes whenever there is any desire for the American government to get involved in a war. Always the concept of Hitler was broke, brought up. Uh, it was brought up uh, with Noriega. It was brought up with Milosevic. It was brought up with Hussein the first time around. And, of course, it was brought up here that he had these unmanned airplanes that could attack America and wreak havoc on America, I suppose, dropping some of those nuclear bombs that he was so busily making, but at least, at the very least, be able to spread biological and chemical uh, poisons all over the east coast of America. And, of course, that's all he wanted to do. He was just intent on conquering America, and that's why we had to go to war against him. Uh, it just is amazing what people will say in order to beat the war drums. But now let's talk to people out in the real world. Let's speak with Guy in Florida first. Good evening, Guy. Good evening, Harry. What's up? Well... It's this idea about uh, terrorism and how it affects every American, and everybody's supposed to get uh, uptight about terrorism. What a lot of Republicans, I was raised one, uh, forget to think is that Republicans believe in less government, right? Mm -hmm. Well, That's what they keep telling us. That's what they tell us, but now less government has taken a, a back, say, backseat to uh, this idea that terrorists are in our, our neighborhoods and in our cities, and they're getting ready to attack us at any moment. And it doesn't matter how many uh, big government steps we need to take. Terrorism is a big deal. Now, 9-11, of course, left a bad taste in my, my mouth, of course, but the uh, fact of the matter is I'm not scared of terrorism. But every Friday when I get my paycheck, I look at uh, how much the federal government takes out of my, my uh, pocket. Every week I get uh, hit with a big, uh, big tax. Absolutely. But only a, a minute majority of people or a minute uh, portion of our population has actually been affected by terror. I mean, have we forgotten that the federal government has gotten out of hand? Well, the federal government is the number one purveyor of force in this country. There's no question about that, that it uses force to take money from us. It uses force to tell businesses how it shall operate. It uses force to decide how much we will donate to what projects. Uh, right now there's a proposition on the uh, California ballot to allocate $3 billion. Uh, wait a second. This is California, remember, that was close to bankruptcy, that has an overwhelming debt that it can't pay off, and they are now going to allocate $3 billion to stem cell research. Now, that's a worthy project, and a lot of people are in favor of it, but the fact is that it is no business of government to use force to take the money from people and put it into this research, which may or may not be effective. Being done by the government, it's not likely to be effective at all. There are all sorts of private agencies around the country that are doing this stem cell research. Why does the state of California have to get into it? And one of the amazing things is that people like Bill Gates are in favor of it. Well, Bill Gates could donate the $3 billion and hardly make a dent in his bank account, but instead he's pushing for the people of California to be taxed to do so. So I 
agree completely with what you're saying, that the real devil that we have to look out for is the government that is taking over our lives and taking our money and taking our freedom and taking our privacy and taking everything that was supposed to be dear to us in a free country called America. Given the similarities you see between Bush and Kerry and saying Bush wants to fight the war on terror, Kerry wants to fight the war on terror, it's just, is this just a diversion to the real push in this country for less government? I think the, the Republicans in the past have, have pushed for less government. It never happens, of course, but they've always been there to say that we're for less government. But if in their heart of hearts they're for more government, do you see the uh, anti-terrorist movement as a way to uh, divert our attention away from that? I don't know if it's so much to divert the attention away from us as it is just to give an excuse to make big government, to make it easier to push through big government programs. And I don't see this as a grand conspiracy among all the different people involved. I think that anybody in a political office has, of course, an incentive to make government bigger and more powerful and give him, in the process, more power. And so everybody is just doing what comes naturally to them. And as you point out, government, uh, Republicans have in the past said that they were for less government. I've always said that they campaign like libertarians, and then they govern like Democrats. But it's interesting that this time around, uh, Bush is not nearly so often saying that the difference between him and Kerry is that he wants you to be able to live your life the way you want to live it, and Kerry thinks that the government ought to run your life. He has said that a few times in this campaign, but he really seemed to believe that it was going to be a slam dunk simply because he was the one who could wage the war on terror more effectively, and that hasn't turned out to be as saleable as he thought it was. So it's, it, it's interesting to me that he didn't think he needed to pull the less government stuff, uh, which seemed to have worked for him in the year 2000. Uh, Guy, thank you very much for calling. I appreciate your comments and uh, check in with us from time to time. And a person named Free says, I think we should call bin Laden's bluff, if it is a bluff. Bring all of our troops home, end all foreign aid, and build a national defense. Then if bin Laden was indeed insincere and attacked us, we'd simply respond in self-defense at that time. Well, it's a good point. Uh, Bob out in cyberspace says, so now that bin Laden has offered an olive branch, what do you suggest we do? Well, it's obvious that no American government at this time is going to do what Free has suggested, but at least what the government could do is to send representatives to talk with representatives of al-Qaeda and see what kind of a deal can be made that would guarantee that there would be no future attacks on America and to explore this. But instead, of course, it's just being rejected out of hand. Not only being rejected out of hand, it's being intentionally misinterpreted so that the American people are not likely to catch on that an offer was even made. That bin Laden actually said, if you don't attack us, we're not going to attack you. And I come back to what I have said from time to time on this show, that with over $2 trillion at its disposal, you would think our government could come up with a better answer to this, that it could hire the best minds in the world to devise a plan for dealing with terrorism that didn't involve going around invading countries and killing innocent people along with the supposed guilty ones. Obviously, there's got to be a better way, and obviously there are people in this world who can come up with better ideas than Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, Colin Powell, George Bush, Condoleezza Rice, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, what's his name, Pearl, and these other people, but of course they won't go outside the inner circle to try to find somebody who can come up with a less damaging, less fatal way of finding a solution to this. Well, let's find out what James in Oregon thinks might be the solution, or maybe he's got something else on his mind. James, good evening. Hello. Hello, James. You're on the air. Oh, hi, Harry. Um, glad to be here. Uh, let's see, you asked a question. Did, did we catch you by surprise? <laughs> well, there's always this deep that comes on when I, just before you, uh, it blocks out about a second's worth of audio. I know, and you, you it does take a little while of a wait before you get on the air, but you really shouldn't take a nap while you're waiting. <laughs> so anyway, what's on your mind tonight? So you asked a question. Um, you uh, uh, said, what's the advantage of, of Kerry over Bush? Or what's the difference between them? Yeah, and uh, here's the thing. It depends on uh, what you think is going on in the world. And let me just give you a glimpse of what some people think is going on. First of all, um, the current war on terror is a manufactured war, just like the war on drugs, manufactured by the military-industrial complex. They want to create a war like it was a new industry. This is their industry. They want to create a multi-billion dollar industry called the War on Terror. And uh, to do that, um, first you have to uh, create the enemy. And that's what they're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan. In fact, if you try to conceive of a better way to manufacture terrorists other than bombing the crap out of their sons and daughters and wives, uh, you also let them keep 380 tons of high explosives. Um, you go on press conferences and say, I'm confident that there'll be another attack in Iraq, which is what George Bush said at one point, that he's confident. Note the use of the word the Freudian flip there. He's confident. Mm -hmm. um, but so, what was he referring to when he said another attack? By whom? 
He was uh, doing a press conference with uh, Al Al Saudi, you know, the new new guy in Iraq. Right. uh, For the, I I think it was the UN or maybe Congress. Yeah, it was Congress. And he said he's confident that there'll be another attack. This man. Attack uh, attack in which direction? uh, Attack against uh, uh, Iraq by terrorists or attack by the United States? Uh, I think he was referring to Iraq, but the gist of the thing is that the man that they want the enemy to um, they want to empower the enemy right now. Sure. Because that would, that's the only way. You can't fight a war if you don't have an enemy. And the war is big business. And they need another one because in 2001, the stock market crashed, and a lot of rich people lost a, a lot of money. Anyway, to answer your question, what's the difference between Kerry and Bush? Well, Bush is part of a, a, a neocon fascist conspiracy, which is uh, basically taken over the White House the last four years. Okay, and since we got to go to a break, tell us quickly what Kerry is. He hasn't been, well, he's been briefed on, on military-industrial complexes, new war. Well, he hasn't decided whether he's going to carry through with it or not. So you're saying that there's a possibility that uh, he might change course? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, James. I appreciate that. Before we go back to the phones, uh, Matt uh, sends an email saying that the statistical likelihood of being killed by terrorists is only 1 in 1.6 million. But on the other hand, the chance of being killed in an auto accident is about 1 in 5,600 or 5,600, as opposed to the 1.6 million. That means you're 300 times more likely to die in a car accident than from a terrorist attack. Matthew, I hope you don't brute those figures around, because if the government hears about it, then we're all going to have to be uh, patted down and searched and go through metal detectors before we get into our cars. Did you ever think of that, Matt, before you brought this up, before you shot your mouth off and told the government that we were far more likely to die in car accidents than we would by terrorist attacks? Matthew, you don't know what you have wrought. All right, let's talk quickly with Kayleen in Massachusetts. Uh, Kayleen, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, my team, Mr. Brown. Good evening. What's I'm up? Sorry, I'm sorry if I have a bit of laryngitis. Um, the Boston Red Sox won the World Series, and I've done a lot of screaming in the last week. Well, I can, I can well understand that, but uh, what's up? Tonight. Well, I can tell you the contrast between Bush and Kerry's stance on war on terrorism. It's absolutely nil. Absolutely, absolutely nil. nil. Okay. There hasn't been peace in the Middle East in tens of thousands of years. And, uh, we're and they both to, talk as if they're going to make it happen. We're suddenly going to initiate it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, are intruding on their government and their countries. It's going to initiate it. Uh, I agree. Absolutely. Uh, if we weren't meddling in their, in their affairs for the last 50 years or so, they wouldn't, they wouldn't bother us at all. Well, I've, I've mentioned this before, but in the Flintstones movie, there's a, a little shot where you see the headline on a newspaper. This, of course, in prehistoric times, and the headline is Middle East Peace Talks Break Down. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree, and, of course, every president thinks he's going to bring peace to the Middle East. Every mm-hmm. president has got the answer. All we've got to do is to put our troops in there and enforce the, this new great thing that's mm-hmm. going to be done, and that's it. Yeah. Go Team America World Police. Yeah. Have you seen that movie, by the way? No, I haven't. It's wonderful. It's so libertarian, and it's so funny. This is I by the twice. people who produce South Park, yeah. I believe, who yeah. are known to be pretty libertarian. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's extremely funny. Yeah. And um, uh, the other point I wanted to make, uh, I'll try to be brief, is um, it, one, a couple of your – one or maybe uh, – Two of your callers uh, made points of um, government versus private research. Donation. Yes, and research and donation. Um, uh, just a, a personal uh, anecdote was: I gave ten dollars uh, and bought a little pocket calendar from a coworker of mine uh, who uh, was selling them for her church. It was a wonderful money. thing for charity. And isn't it amazing how much charity can do when the government is not involved? Of course. Thanks so much, Kayleen. And before we go back to the phones, I want to remind you that two days ago was an important anniversary, not just my wife's birthday which makes it important in its own right, but also because it was the anniversary of the Statue of Liberty, the unveiling of the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor on October 28, 1886. And unfortunately, most people are unaware of the statue's background. As I've said before on this show, it was a gift from the French people who voluntarily donated the money to build the statue, send it across the Atlantic to the American people, who then voluntarily donated the money to create a pedestal for it and erect it in New York Harbor. And it was a sense of appreciation by the French people for the fact that there was one country in the world that was truly free in their eyes, a place where nobody asked for your papers, nobody fastened a number on you, nobody extorted a percentage of your income as the price of getting a job, and where you were free to pursue the life that you'd always dreamed of without the government setting the rules and telling you what you must do and what you can't do. And more than anything else, perhaps, it was a country that welcomed people from all over the world, refugees, immigrants, people who were downtrodden in their own countries. And it didn't matter whether they were rich or poor. If they could just somehow get on a boat and come to America, they would be welcomed. America wasn't afraid of immigrants then. It doesn't mean there wasn't any prejudices. Of course, there are always prejudices. It's part of human nature. 
but people were not afraid of immigrants because they recognized that any immigrant was going to add something to the country. He was going to provide a service or product or whatever it might be, even just as an employee someplace, he was going to make more things available than were available before. A free country has nothing to fear from people coming in or going out. It is the welfare state that is scared to death of every rich person who can get in, and pardon me, every poor person who can get in and every rich person who can get out. And so when Emma Lazarus wrote those lovely words that are inscribed on the base of the statue, they made sense to people everywhere. And they made sense because the statue was facing outward to the world, holding her lamp up high. And the, the statue, Lady Liberty, said, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest-tossed, to me. I lit my lamp beside the golden door. That's the America we once had, the beacon of liberty, providing light and hope and inspiration to the entire world. The America we have forsaken for a mess of tasteless pottage. And of course, that is the America we should have. And like you, I am determined that that is the America we will have again. Well, let's talk now with Roger in Clymer, New York. Good evening, Roger. Sorry to keep you waiting so long. Oh, uh, thanks, Harry. I, I just want you to know that uh, I just want to make a comment. I believe that you made a slight mistake uh, in your broadcast tonight. I never make mistakes. Like George Bush, I just can't think of a single mistake I've made in my life. Well, well yeah, you, yes, I, I, I want to know that you were sitting there saying that John Kerry or George W. Bush want to increase the federal government size. But haven't they already done it? I mean, we got the Patriot Act, we got the No Child Left Behind law, we got the Medicare drug bill, and we got the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, which, you know, you know, I mean, all these things, I mean, they're increasing the size and scope of government as we speak. I mean, So you're saying, all, saying I shouldn't have put it in the future tense. Yeah, they've already done it. That is true, and um, Bush uh, uh, says in his speeches we need to continue on the same road that we've been on the last four years. So, obviously, it is going to continue, and uh, John Kerry has not proposed a single way in which government would be reduced. In fact, in none of the three debates, to the best of my knowledge, did either candidate suggest even a reduction in any government program, l let alone a reduction in government itself. Well, well, I didn't watch any of the so-called debates, I mean, because... How can anyone debate something if they're in agreement with it? Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess during the debate, supposedly there's like a, I heard, I don't know if this is true or not, but it was like a 40-page deal to get them together, yeah, spec set, set specifying everything, you know, a set of rules, you know, you know, what kind of tie had to be worn, you know, if maybe you couldn't look at the other guy too long. It was probably even like uh, what uh, broadcasters the media were acceptable to uh, both sides. I mean, and no one asked the, uh, any obvious questions like, uh, what was what was the constitutional basis for uh, this program or that program? Yeah, right. Or, not true. or or this war or you know, right? I mean, I wish they'd ask Kerry why. What, what constitutional basis did you have for voting to allow George W. Bush to go to war if you wanted to? You know, you know for that vote for the war in Iraq. You know, I mean, the Senate gave up its authority mm -hmm. to do so. I mean, I mean, why would why would you want to do that? I mean, just so you can complain about it the next time when when he goes in saying, well, you shouldn't have done it. Well, you let him do it. Right. Well, as, as we've said before, it is not a question of Bush's abusing the power. He never should have been given the power in the first place, and so Kerry should quit whining about that, obviously, because he, he authorized it. That, that's true. I mean, it's the same thing with the, the Medicare drug bill. I don't know if Kerry voted for it or not. But well, it was for more government, wasn't it? Well, have you noticed that the, um, the cost of the drugs has gone down, hasn't it? Uh, <laughs> it sure looks like it has to me. You know, well, well, yeah. Well, the guy on my street corner is not charging as much for crack as he was before, so I guess the Bush program is working. <laughs> yes. Incidentally, Bush does uh, climb all over Kerry about voting against this military program or that military program, and of course, no one points out what might have been in any of those bills that would have been offensive to any right-thinking American that might have caused Kerry to vote against those things, and I don't know if that's why it was, but I know that practically every bill that is passed includes all kinds of things that you wouldn't dream would have anything to do with it. Roger, thanks so much for your call. Before we go back to the phone, let me take a couple of emails. I keep in encouraging people to send emails, and then I do not get them to them too often on the broadcast. And James out in cyberspace says, I haven't heard anything about the TV show that you have mentioned over a month ago. Can you tell us when the show is due to be on the air, and so on? Well, we are doing some reshooting on it because there were some uh, problems with the final cut that we had, and so it may be a while longer before we can present it to TV networks. So there is nothing scheduled so far. However, I can say that one network has shown a great deal of interest in the show, but, of course, that's subject to seeing the pilot, and 
They may not be so hot on the idea once they see the pilot. Dave in Arizona writes, Last week I called to talk about airline travel, but I don't think I explained myself well. I was recently singled out as a suspected terrorist in an airport and groped and humiliated beyond what I believed possible in America. Along with the humiliation, it made me wonder that if they felt that I, a 55-year-old blind man, might be a terrorist, and the only way they could know for sure was to feel me up and humiliate me, what is the purpose of the search they make everyone else endure? If the kind of special search I was subjected to is for suspected terrorists, and if they don't know who is a terrorist, why do they bother to search people in ways that they do not consider to be adequate? I believe it's to condition us for the future. What do you think? Well, I don't think it's a conspiracy moving towards big government and that there are a whole bunch of people in a dark room somewhere that make up all these plans. I think that it is just government run amok and that it is necessary to keep stepping up this stuff because they really don't know what they're doing. So they seize on any event as an excuse to step up the security and get more involved in our lives. And it's not that anyone really cares what's in your emails, but they just want to be doing something. And I don't know that that's really the answer to it all, but I do not think that this is some kind of a conspiracy any more than the normal uh, harmony of interest that politicians have, all of them have, in making government bigger to give them more power. Uh, Matt in Salt Lake City says it may turn out that a majority of Americans will never accept libertarianism. If so, what do you think of the possibility of a group of libertarians purchasing land from a foreign nation with the purpose of trying to create a new country that follows libertarian principles? Countries have sold land with sovereignty many times in the past, such as the Russians selling Alaska to us. What would it take for a country to do so again to a private group of people? Well, I've never given it any thought, Matt, so I really can't offer any kind of intelligent response to it. If uh, someone looks into it and comes up with a plan, then I would certainly be glad to... Uh, examine it and offer my opinion on it. Well, let's see what Al's opinion is. He's out in New Mexico. Al, what's on your mind tonight? Hi, Harry. Um, actually, in line with what uh, that last emailer said, do have a free state project. Sure. Uh, so that's one idea. Uh, but the reason I called is that Bush has done a horrendous job, obviously, in promoting smaller government. He's it's, it's expanded. Uh, he wrote a recent article um, faster than Clinton's at the time, and Kerry's rhetoric is nothing but government. So because he's Canada's first smaller government, that's why I voted for Bednarik. My question is, which of these two do you think is going to do less damage to uh, uh, individual freedom? I don't think that there's any way to know. If you, if somebody stuck a gun to my head and said I had to choose between them, I would probably choose Kerry for the reason that he would at least have a free hand. Bush is bound by the past. Bush can't turn back on the road that he has taken. And uh, there are a lot of reasons that I believe that, but that's my conclusion with regard to Bush. Kerry might take a different path. He might say, all right, uh, I've got to come up with something different here to show that I'm better than Bush. And, of course, that different path that Kerry takes might even be worse than Bush. But right. there is the chance that it might be better. And well, he's he's so, defending with the Republican Congress, which is encouraging, because that way they'll, they'll you know, gridlock each other into doing less damage. Yes, that's uh, very true, and that may be the reason that government grew more slowly under Clinton than it did right. under, under Bush. And, of course, we know that a lot of these Republican leaders in Congress and outside of Congress, I mean, people like Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and so on, would have been all over a Democratic president doing some of the things that Bush has done. Right. They, they would have really been criticizing him, and Kerry's election might bring back some of that criticism from influential people. <clears throat> we haven't been getting criticism of Bush from the liberal side nearly as much as we should have because the liberals have fallen into line on Iraq and these other things. So the only things they criticize Bush on is tax cuts for the rich and uh, not devoting enough money to education or health care or whatever it is, but it's really been tepid and it hasn't been uh, news making the way it would be if Republicans were criticizing a Democratic president. Right, well, Gary voted for the war and he criticized Howard Dean for being against the war uh, during the Democrat primaries, and now that the war is not very popular, he's criticizing Bush for Russian war. Sure. So I, I don't, like you, I don't see any difference between the two. Yeah, well, what are you going to do? I voted for Ben Merrick. Oh, you said that already. I'm sorry. Uh, you, <laughs> you early voted. That's right. I sent an absentee ballot. And I'm a small voter officially, so um, my vote actually counts to some degree. Well, good for you. And um, I would be interested in what anybody else has to say about what they finally decided to do in this year of the dilemma, this year in which never before has there been such a gigantic difference between the two major candidates. All right. Well, Harry, dear, I'm glad you're out there pointing that out. Uh, you got a great show, and I love your column, and I love everything you do. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the call, Al. And before we go to the break, let me mention about columns that if you go to my website, harrybrown.org, there is a multitude of articles I've written. Uh, I've had Logaria, which is um, 
kind of running off at the mouth, I believe would be a proper definition of it. But in any event, there are a number of articles there, probably well over 100, and there's a topical index. So if you're interested in articles on a particular subject, you can just go to that index and find a choice of several articles on most of the major uh, issues that have come up in the last 10, 20 years. And there are other things there. There's a daily journal where I, not daily, but three or four times a week, make comments on what's going on. So just go to harrybrown.org and you can get all of that. Kayleen in Massachusetts, who was on the show in the first hour, uh, sent an email saying to continue the point I tried to make earlier, because I guess I cut her off when we were about to go to the news. She says, isn't it amazing how many people can benefit from charity? No one took that $10 out of my pocket by force to support some lame government program. My co-worker's church does a lot of charity work in third world countries completely with private donations. I gave this money gladly and would give much more if the government weren't stealing 33% of my pay for programs and wars that I have no say over. My co-worker's church, without prejudice of any kind, sends missionaries to these countries. Each church member pays his or her own travel there, and nearly every cent on the dollar goes to the underprivileged people they've traveled to. I gave my hard-earned money, and I was glad to. Well, it's a very good point, Kayleen. When you are, have money taken from you for a government program, supposedly to benefit some people in the country, almost always only a small percentage of the money that's been confiscated from the taxpayers actually makes it to those who benefit. I have told you before about the flood, uh, flood uh, relief program in North Dakota and Minnesota where they passed a, an enormous bill, and none of the money wound up in flood relief. But the same is true for the highway bills that they pass. They wind up going into things like the Big Dig in Boston or, or the subway in Los Angeles that have nothing to do with highways or, or only the remotest connection, and so the money doesn't get there. But if you donate to a private charity, most of them do have administrative costs, but the administrative costs are nothing compared to what the government takes. Now, somebody else who uh, we talked with earlier and still has uh, more to say and we didn't get to is James in Oregon. James, did you have a further point you wanted to make? Um, actually, uh, I'm calling about something completely different because uh, the, la the last rant and rave <laughs> okay. which, uh, was kind of long. Um, the uh, Bush administration has just asked Congress for $70 billion more for the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know this, of course, right? It's uh, yes. news, I, I heard that, yes. Um, for the benefit of your listeners, um, a little common sense in a pocket calculator, um, I pretty much put together an astounding fact about $70 billion. What if, in fact, uh, it went to something else, like, say, uh, a federal government office that gave away to anyone who walked in the door $1,000 every 10 minutes? Uh, how much would it cost to operate one of those? No, let's, let's put one of those federal government offices in every single state in the union, all 50 states, okay? Yeah, well... I, all they I, had to do was give out $1,000 every 10 minutes. You could operate 50 of those offices, one in every state in the union, for 18 years. Well, you, you could give out $70 million of those $1,000 checks, and that uh, would be almost one for every family in America. It would be close to it. But imagine an office that gave away $1,000 every 10 minutes to whoever, walked, whoever showed up. Yes. You could do that for 18 years in every state in the Union with that $70 billion. Isn't that astounding that you could actually give away money? You couldn't even give it away yes, as well, fast as they're spending it? Well, it is important to translate anything like that $70 billion into how much per family, and to ask people, what would you do with that money if it hadn't been taken from you to go to uh, put uh, more soldiers and more armor and more tanks and, and more guns into Iraq to kill more people, uh, what would you have done with the $1,000 that your family could have had in instead, and get people to start visualizing the actual cost to themselves, because even the dollars are not the actual cost, it's what is foregone because of the dollars that have been taken from you, what it was you could have done. Maybe it was that you would have been able to take that vacation to Disneyland this year that you've been promising the family for so many years. Maybe it would be that you could get new clothes for everybody in the family. Maybe it would be something else. But the point is that once people start visualizing it, they begin to get a bit resentful about the fact that it was their money to begin with and there were things they could do with it, and now they won't be able to do those things with it. Fair enough. Um, I'm just thinking a lot of people, they see $70 billion, they figure, oh, I saw a figure like that last week. It's par for the course. But when they realize how big, how enormous, how much... Sure. Raw power. That money represents. Right. Well, as uh, I think it was Everett Dirksen, the senator from Illinois, first said, a billion dollars here, a billion dollars there, and the next thing you know, you're actually dealing with some real money. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, thanks for uh, letting me call again. And um, by the way, I voted Libertarian across the board. I've already, I did it absentee. Oh, good for you. Thank you so much for calling, Jim. James, pardon me for getting familiar. And uh, uh, Pakal, out there in Ohio, I think it is, uh, says... Have you heard of the special Young American Voter campaign that is growing in support around this country called Vote or Die by the famous rap mu musician Puff Diddy, Citizen Combs? Hmm, doesn't he play one of the theme musics that we use on this show? Puff Diddy, Citizen Combs. Which he says that the Young American vote, ages 18 to 35, is the most frightening unknown voter to the two main party system in America and could be the group of people who creates the possible outcome of this election in 2004 and beyond. 
Please give your comments on this vote-or-die campaign which supports the Libertarian Party as the only political solution for America's future. Um, well, I'm not sure that that youth campaign supports the Libertarian Party. It would be nice if it did. But I'm a little bit uh, reluctant to say good things about anything that any campaign that says, come on, get out and vote. It's your future. Please vote. Because people don't really know what they're voting for in many cases. And there's a good reason that a lot of people don't vote. They don't know anything about it, so why would we want them voting? And a lot of people are not voting because they don't, because they do know about it and they don't see any difference between the candidates and they don't want to endorse them. Or they don't see enough of a difference to warrant going down to the polls, spending the energy. And there are people who just simply don't uh, see any point in voting because they know that their vote isn't going to make any difference. And I don't think that increasing the voter turnout is some kind of universal good that we should all support. I would never say it doesn't matter whom you vote for, just get out and vote. I don't think that that makes much sense. I think that you should vote if you think that it is going to make a difference in the sense that your vote is going to register some kind of opinion. And that's why I say I think you should either vote libertarian or not vote at all. And as I've said before, not voting is no sin. You have no duty no obligation to vote, not if this is supposed to be a free country. We have an email from Pierre, who is an American in Canada. He says, in response to the gentleman proposing the foundation of a new libertarian nation, there have been several attempts to do so in recent history. That's right, there was one attempt in the Pacific, and I believe it was in the New Hebrides Islands, and I cannot remember the name of the island, but eventually uh, the nearby government came and just simply by force ejected the libertarians who were trying to set up a new country there. They had I believe, bought the island, and yet they were not able to defend it. Pierre goes on to say, given that countries go to battle over seemingly worthless pieces of land all the time, from the Gaza Strip to the Falklands, I think it would take a tremendous amount of money to accomplish this. And, as I said, uh, he's right about that, because uh, the people were not able to defend themselves on that Pacific island, and they would need a lot of money to build the kind of defenses necessary. Pierre goes on to say, furthermore, why should we libertarians have to leave our home countries? It would be too beneficial to authoritarian states to have a mass exodus of freedom-loving people from quasi-free countries. Well, as far as why should we have to leave, we may have a right to stay here and be free, but reality is telling us that that right is not being respected. I believe it was the philosopher Max Stirner who said, having the right is a wonderful thing, but a little bit of might is a lot more effective. And Pierre goes on to say, a real libertarian country, however, would also perhaps be too competitive and thus very threatening to the rest of the world. If you doubt that, look at what has happened to many offshore tax havens, like the Bahamas, Bermuda, and so forth, all of whom have been pressured into sharing information with the U.S. government. So true, so true. Uh, if I were going to try to form a libertarian country somewhere else, I would not put it in the position of trying to attract capital from the U.S. as a tax haven, because as Pierre points out, that's a sure way to get the government of the United States after you. A couple of things that have come up this past week. Uh, the Lancet, a British medical journal, did a study before the Iraqi war and after the Iraqi, or, or in the present of the Iraqi war, to determine how many civilians have likely died. We've heard estimates of 10,000 and sometimes more than that, but the Lancet came up with the, the astounding figure that they believe around 100,000 people have died, civilians. They have died from bombings, they have died from attacks by U.S. and coalition forces, and they have died in the crossfire from the attacks by the resistance, the car bombings and things of this sort. And so 100,000 people do not consider that the world is better off with Saddam Hussein gone. At least they were alive when Saddam Hussein was there, and now they are dead. And uh, they did the study rather carefully, and it has been peer-reviewed, because The Lancet is a medical journal that deals in, in new proposals and peer review of those proposals, new studies, I should say, rather than proposals. So it's interesting that they've come up with a figure that large. Most of the evidence that's been given that the world is better off with Saddam Hussein gone has failed to add up if you really look at it closely. They talk about the torture and so on. Well, that's what happened at Abu Ghraib and other uh, prisons in Iraq once the Americans took over. They talk about the mass graves, but nobody really has identified who's in those mass graves. Are they Iraqi citizens that were killed willy-nilly by the Hussein regime, and there were so many of them, they couldn't put them in individual graves, they had to dump them in large pits? Or perhaps they may be soldiers from the uh, Gulf War. Uh, we know that at the end of the Gulf War, towards the end of the Gulf War, that American troops used bulldozers to simply plow the bodies of Iraqi soldiers into large uh, pits and covered them over. So some of those mass graves may be people that were killed by coalition forces in the first Gulf War. 
Some of the mass graves may also be made up of soldiers uh, who died in the war with Iran. They may be Iranian soldiers. They may be Iraqi soldiers. Some of them may be Kurds who were caught in the crossfire between Iraqis and Iranis. So we just simply do not know who were in those mass graves, but it's a wonderful thing to just toss off the statement uh, that there were mass graves in Iraq. There have been mass graves in most every war that has occurred because it is just not up to uh, an invading army to stop and dig individual graves for all the people that are killed in the invasion. Dave sends an email asking if I'll post the link about the civilians dying in Iraq. Yes, I will. It'll be on there just shortly after the end of the broadcast. You can go to my website, harrybrown.org, and right at the top of the homepage, you'll see a link to the radio links page where there are articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast. There are also two articles linked there regarding the uh, Statue of Liberty and the background on it. And there is an article, of, it's actually the transcript from Al Jazeera of Bin Laden's tape. Actually, there are transcripts also that have been posted by CNN and Fox TV News, among others. And every transcript is slightly different because everyone is based on somebody's tra uh, translation. Uh, I believe the Al Jazeera one is taken from the subtitles that were put on the original tape. In other words, the original tape came with subtitles on it in English. Now, I'm not positive of that, but that's the impression I got from what they say on the Al Jazeera website. So that'll be, that's already there, and I will put that Lancet article on there. It actually, um, you have to sign up at the Lancet. So what I may do is put on uh, an article that describes the Lancet study rather than the Lancet study itself. <clears throat> well, I hope that we can put this election campaign behind us, whoever gets elected, and uh, if we have to hope for anything, let's hope that this thing does not drag on to the courts for another month or two, and we listen to both sides accusing the other side of fraud and lying and all this stuff. That's all they know how to do. And pray, pray that the talk shows, the commentary shows, the panel shows will no longer have a Republican and a Democrat on yelling and screaming about this election and repeating the same old slogans over and over again, but that they will actually find something else to talk about. I hope so, because I am just sick to death of this campaign. I think I would rather be out on the campaign trail myself, getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, rather than being here and having to face it on television and, and hear all this stuff that goes on. Well, look, we've got a nice week ahead, a week of your life, in which I hope you will enjoy yourself. And I hope you'll do something nice for yourself and your family this week, because there's a lot more to life than politics and elections. So take advantage of it and enjoy it. But above all, don't forget to come back next Saturday night. This is Harry Brown saying good night. <laughs>